Hi, this video explains special relativity in a bottom-up fashion, which I personally think is less confusing. It's a video I wish I had seen when I first learned relativity. It's in the spirit of Hendrik Lorenz, Henri Poincaré, and John Bell. It also sets the stage for later videos that take a substratum viewpoint of general relativity in quantum mechanics. Let's get started. Let's look at the three basic phenomena of special relativity. We're going to have two identical spaceships. The first one is at rest. It never moves. We're going to put some things inside the spaceship. So let's cut it through the middle so we can see inside. First, let's put a stick inside. The stick is one unit long and can be used to measure the length of other objects. Let's add a second stick that points forward. Now we're ready for the first phenomenon, which is length contraction. Objects that move contract, but only in the direction of motion, not sideways. The moving spaceship is identical to the first one, but because it's moving, it's shorter. The same is true for the sticks inside. The horizontal one is half as long as at rest. The vertical one is as long as before, but skinnier. In this case, the spaceship moves at 87% of the speed of light. We chose this speed to get a factor of 2 in contraction. The second phenomenon is time dilation. At high speed, objects move in slow motion. The clock on the moving spaceship runs at half speed compared to the clock at rest. This may be familiar from the twins paradox. If you fly to a different star and then return to Earth, you'll be younger than your twin who stayed at home. By the way, if you look at the clock hand, you'll notice the first effect, length contraction, when the clock hand is horizontal, but not when it's vertical. The third phenomenon is desynchronization. This means that a clock farther ahead in the direction of motion will run behind clocks farther behind. We can see that this is the case for the moving clocks, but not on the spaceship at rest. So, do objects contract and slow down with velocity? Einstein came up with the theory of special relativity in 1905, but already before him, using classical physics, these phenomena had been predicted. For example, an electric charge has feed lines coming out in a symmetric fashion. But when the charge moves, these feed lines bunch up as if the field had been contracted. This was noted by George Fitzgerald in 1889, 16 years before Einstein. Also, the orbit of an electron around a nucleus is affected. When the atom moves, the orbit changes from a circle to an ellipse. It contracts by the same amount as in special relativity. And the time to complete one orbit increases, also by the same amount as in special relativity. This was noted by Joseph Larmer in 1900. Finally, let's look at how to synchronize clocks at different locations. Here we have a firecracker halfway between two clocks. When it explodes, it creates a light flash. When the light flash arrives at a clock, that clock is reset to zero and started. Let's play that back one more time. Now for the moving ship, we do the same thing. Here, one clock is approaching the firecracker, so it'll get reset first. The other clock is moving away from the firecracker, so it takes a while for the light flash to catch up. When it does, the first clock is already ahead. This is how clocks on a moving spaceship end up not synchronized. Let's play that back one more time. You can try to come up with a different method for synchronizing clocks. For example, you can put two clocks in the middle of the ship, start them, and then move them apart. However, when you move them apart, the front clock has a higher velocity than the rear clock, and therefore is going to run more slowly while you move it. The result is exactly the same. The front clock is behind by the same amount. Now that we totally understand the three phenomena, we look at situations that seem paradoxical, and it will be easy to figure out. Let's look at Bell's paradox. We have two identical spaceships at rest. 
Each is four units long. And the distance between them is two units. They are connected by a thin thread that could easily break if you pull on it too hard. Now here's the question. If both spaceships accelerate identically, will the thread contract and break? Well, yes, it will. All objects contract, including the thread. In addition, the rocket engines will keep the same distance, so the contracted spaceships will have more space between them. This should all be obvious when you totally understand the basic phenomena, but many people get this question wrong. One reason is that they think of the two spaceships as one system, and that somehow the space between them should contract. But space does not contract. Space is the background in which things contract, things like spaceships and threads. Of course, we could replace a thread by a strong wire that does not break. When the wire contracts, it would pull the two spaceships together, but that would be a different question. We're now almost ready for the greatest paradox, which is that everyone measures the same value for the speed of light. But first, let's look at how you measure the speed of an object, like a bullet. Well, you need two detectors at two locations. You measure the distance between them and you record the time at each detector. Let's do it. The velocity is distance divided by time. This bullet went at 87% of the speed of light. It's very important that we have a clock at each detector. You cannot stand at one detector and look at a clock far away because it takes time for the light to reach your eye and you'll see an old value for the time. This is why we have been putting two clocks on the spaceships and why we have been making sure they are synchronized. To measure the speed of light, we use a firecracker. And we get the velocity of four divided by four, which is one. But what about the moving spaceship? The poor guy has measurement equipment that's all messed up. The sticks are short. The clocks are slow and they don't even show the same time. So let's see what happens. When the firecracker explodes, the nearby clock shows zero. The one behind shows 3.46. The flash travels toward the second detector and the clocks advance at half speed. The detector gets the light flash when its clock reads four. So again, we get four divided by four, which is one, the same value for the speed of light. Amazing. All this messed up equipment is messed up in just the right way. The three phenomena conspire to make sure that everyone measures the same speed of light. We should point out that the velocity is only measured to be the same for light. For example, if we fire the bullet at the same speed as a moving spaceship, that spaceship will measure the bullet speed to be zero. So, if someone in the moving ship observes the ship at rest, shouldn't they conclude that it's twice as long and that its clocks run twice as fast? No, they won't. That's the other great paradox. If you're in the moving ship, you'll measure the exact opposite, that the ship at rest is half as long as you are, and that its clocks are slow and desynchronized. How can this be? Well, let's first look at how the ship at rest measures the ticking rate of a moving clock. The ship at rest is doing the measuring, so it needs two detectors at two locations. Let's look at the rear moving clock. When it passes the first detector, we see that it reads zero, and our time is zero. When it passes the second detector, our clock there reads 4.58, but the moving clock reads only half as much. Simple. Now let's have the moving ship do the same thing. At the first detector, both ships have time zero, but notice that the rear clock is desynchronized, it's ahead. Now the ship moves with clocks that tick at half rate. It takes 2.29 seconds for the second detector to reach the same point. It ticked slowly, but started ahead, 
So now it shows 4.58 seconds, twice as much as the clock at rest. In other words, the moving ship measures a faster clock to be slower. Amazing. Again, we see that the three phenomena conspire so that the moving ship cannot tell that it's moving. We can do a similar setup for length contraction and for desynchronized clocks, but this video will get too long. Let's leave it as an exercise for the viewer. I want to point out how language can be confusing. A book on relativity might say something like, according to the moving ship, the ship at rest is half as long. In this video, we don't say is, we say is measured to be. We usually think of the word is to mean something that is objectively true, not something that depends on the velocity of our spaceship. Let's put that on a plaque and emboss it. In relativity, replace is with is measured to be, and a lot of confusion goes away. We'll see a similar language confusion in quantum mechanics. Let's also point out that a person on the moving spaceship will not notice the length contraction. She and the sticks and the objects to be measured all contract together, so there is no way to notice. The same thing goes for time. The person, her clock, and the neurons in her brain all run in slow motion, so there is no way to notice. Look at the moving stick. It's not horizontal. The motion of the rear end is ahead of the front end, just like rear clocks are ahead of front clocks. The neural signals that tell the body to move arrive first at the rear half of the body, then later at the front half. Before we wrap up, let's take a look at a particle-like thing called a breather, which is a localized, nonlinear wave. Whoa, what was that? First, look at the normal linear wave equation for a one-dimensional string. It only has solutions that run away with some velocity, the speed of sound or speed of light of the medium. But now add a nonlinear term to the wave equation, and we have solutions where the energy stays in one place. The pieces of string oscillate between kinetic energy and potential energy, or tension. The energy is trapped in one small region of space, and since mass is energy, we can pretend that this trapped energy is a particle. Well, does it behave as a particle? In some ways, it does. Let's look at a moving solution to the equation. This breather moves at 87% of the speed of the medium. Look closely, and you will see the same three phenomena as for our spaceships and clocks and atoms. It's contracted by a factor of two. The oscillations are half as fast. And during each oscillation, the rear part is ahead of the front part, kind of like with the stick we just saw. When we later get to general relativity, we'll also see that the breather accelerates in a gravitational field. And in quantum mechanics, we'll speculate on how breathers might display wave-particle duality in different interactions. Special relativity is often presented top-down, where we start with the assumption that the speed of light is measured to be constant. We use the bottom-up approach. John Bell also likes the bottom-up approach, as being more pedagogical, I strongly recommend his essay, How to Teach Special Relativity. In it, he writes, the approach of Einstein differs from that of Lorentz in philosophy and style. Lorentz prefer the view that there is indeed a state of real rest, defined by the ether, even though the laws of physics conspire to prevent us identifying it experimentally. When we get to general relativity and quantum mechanics, will come across other conspiracies of nature. As a bonus minute, let's look at a spinning ring. It foreshadows some things we'll meet in general relativity. The ring is made of 16 sticks. Each is one unit long and mounted on a spoke. So the circumference is 16. As before, we can synchronize clocks around the ring. But because the ring curves, we'll need something like an optical fiber to guide the light flashes. Notice that the clocks at the bottom get a flash from each direction, and they show the same time. When the ring spins, the sticks contract in the direction of instantaneous motion, but the spokes do not contract along the radius because it's perpendicular to the motion. 
With the short sticks, we now measure more diameter around the ring, while the radius stays the same. So we no longer have that the circumference is 2 pi times the radius. And if we try to synchronize clocks, the light flashes go at different speeds relative to the ring. And so we cannot synchronize all the way around the ring when the ring spins. Let's play that back one more time. That's it. I'll see you in the next video on general relativity. For more videos, go to physicsisnotweird.com. And I'm Aiden Bernander.